Thanks everyone, my name is Loyal Peterson. I'm sharing the work with you guys, I'm not the pastor yet. But I have the privilege of sharing the work from time to time. So if you have a Bible with us, and you're more than welcome to watch it on screen, it is well. I was speaking of the topic of following after Jesus, or following Jesus. And this is all one of the key points actually for us as Christians to do. I mean, that is the one thing that we all want to do is to follow Jesus. And these days it's become quite a, a difficult topic. Because when you speak of a Christian, you obviously assume there's a definition or there is a, a description of what understanding what a Christian is. That at least was my view. And then I realized when you look at the world and all the topics and all the issues currently arising everywhere, and even people proclaiming to be Christian, and you look at what they're doing in the country, um, that's what being a Christian is all about. And it's really a question then to come into, okay, um, am I a Christian then? When you look at somebody we think and as we've got the opportunity, we think it's really holy. Wow, that's a Christian. Definitely a Christian. Cut out to be a Christian. And then the question we come to, am I still a Christian? If I compare myself to this person, I don't feel like a Christian anymore. Really? Am I a Christian? And that becomes really a discussion on its own. But it's also really a place where you come to what is the definition of Christian? I just went and did a quick search on the Google on friendly neighbor of Delta and on the Merriam Webster dictionary there were quite a few um, definitions. Let's see just go to the definitions. First page. Okay. So this is the definition according to a dictionary, not the dictionary, there's many dictionaries, but this is just a quick one I found. So Christians one professes a belief in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Sounds good. No problem there, I think. Disciple, in the sense of two, a member of the church of Christ. Now this becomes separating from the disciples of Christ in 1906. A member of the Christian denomination having part of the union in the United Church of Christ concluded in 1961. Now then I'm getting lost. What's well, a Christian now? Just the second definition. Second page two. It just it, it just continues from there, so it just goes on to this. Now this speaks to the, the adjective of or relating to Christianity, Christian scriptures, based on performing with Christianity, Christian ethics, or relating to being a Christian, Christian responsibility. So the next one, the last one, professing Christianity, Christian affirmation, Christian country. Treating other people in a kind and generous way, having Christian concerns over others. Now I'm getting lost. What's a Christian again? And that's not even the worst part, because the worst part is, we'll come to that one next to you. The worst part is people, like I said, that you look into the world and confessing to be Christian, when you know for a fact there's no way that person is a Christian. I can't remember the person's name, but he is the one who committed the murder in Norway, where he killed some kids, teenagers, at a youth camp. And on his Facebook, he stated he was a Christian. And the media took hold of that comment and had a field day with Christians. Because here is this professing Christian killing, murdering kids. And immediately your question becomes, a Christian? Really? What does the world think? What does the world understand under that term? If you look at the worldly definition of a Christian, you may very well fit into that definition of a Christian. 
So it becomes quite difficult for us to follow and say, but I'm a Christian. What does that mean? What does it mean when you say, I'm a Christian? And that's a part that you went ahead now, but this is the true original meaning of a Christian in the uh, Greek sense. The next part. Now, I can't pronounce the Greek word there, but it basically pronounces Christianos, which is a follower of Christ. And I'll raise my hand to that definition if you can. Because when you're following Christ, your life reflects a certain way of thinking, a certain way of doing that is reflected in Christ, or Christ is reflected in you. It's not something that you decide today, I'm a Christian because I like the values. It's great values. But is it life changing? Is it enough to change the way that you live? Just saying it's nice values is not the same as saying I'll change my life. Or I will give my life for those values. And to be a follower of Christ brings us to a different topic for people. What Christians want to proclaim Christianhood is and what the definition of Christian is. And that's really a place where we sometimes have to become quiet and ask ourselves this question, question instead of Am I a follower of Christ? Do I follow Jesus? And the question becomes, what does that mean? If you look at Matthew 4 from verse 18 to 20, and Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, cast their net into sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now this is the perfect example of what it means to actually follow Christ. But this is in the past. It was the exact case of actually following the physical person, Jesus. The disciples walked in his footsteps, literally. The disciples rubbed shoulders with Jesus. They were following. But that's a physical connotation, explanation. It makes sense. There's no way to misunderstand it. They were following who Jesus was, the person, the man, going to the miracles, going through the hardships. But before the cross, there came a crossroads for them to say, but do you follow me? I know you will run away. But you do not understand what is about to happen at the cross. And then they physically step back and say, whoa, this is going way above what I understood my calling was, my discipleship meant. Jesus giving up his life. I thought he was going to be king. Now he died on the cross. So what does it mean to follow Christ? What does it mean to follow Jesus? If we're professing to be Christians, I believe all of us do in this world. You are a follower of Jesus. How do I know that? How do you know that I'm a follower of Jesus? How do I know that you are a follower of Jesus? How do we measure that? I can't see you following Jesus. How do we replicate that? How do we understand that in the context of life today to understand that God wants us to live in a specific way and obey the truth that He reveals to us through His Word, in prayer, in church. Now, church is a very, very valid vehicle for God to use. I'm not saying anything against church or Christians. But the term is, the term is sometimes misused, misrepresented, even by us, ourselves, in church, outside of church. When the taxi drives in front of you, Who's following Jesus and who's following his anger? Now we all human, we all make mistakes, we all make that disconnect sometimes. 
There's nothing wrong with that. But if we profess to be Christians, what is the consequence? What standard are we trying to uphold? Now that comes a very dangerous word in the Christian terms of standard. What is the standard? What is supposed to be different inside of us compared to the world? When the world looks at us and another person, what is their defining? Where is the defining line that separates the left from the right? Where is that line? How do we define that line? Is it simply saying enough that I believe in Christ? What's the first definition? That we believe in Christ. It's the part that it says, great that you believe, but even demons believe in God. So there's a difference there. It's not just believing, it's something slightly different. Something more creative. So, what are the telltale signs that we have to know whether the person next to us is following Jesus? question becomes for all of us. Are we following Jesus in the way we should? Are we following a pastor? Are we following a church? Are we following worship music? Nothing against church, nothing against pastors, nothing against worship music. They all break the all Within the area of Christianity, they have specific meaning and purpose. But they can become the defining line that separates an understanding of what it means to follow Jesus. Because we can worship like crazy on a Sunday, but it comes Monday at work, we are a completely different person. And God will hold us to account to say, but you worship my name on Sunday, but on Monday you are walking all over it. How do you define that? How do you play that out? Anybody wants to give me an answer to that? A show of hands. How would you define a Christian? Now this is going to be a very interactive service, so you have to shout. I'll give you the mic today, but you can shout it out. Today, it's not the defining one, but it is an important one. 
but it's also quite a complex one to say, but how do we know that we are followers of Jesus? In John 14, verse 15 to 18. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because he is season and not knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and will be in you. And I will not leave your orphans, I will come to you. What is just to focus on now on that first part? If you love me, keep my commandments. That is one definition of what it means to follow Jesus. An indicator, a footprint in the sand, you call it. But he says, My commandments. What commandments is he referring to? Ten commandments? Obviously not. Although those are he used his commands from the Old Testament, and it's not his commandments. So what commandments is Jesus referring to in this passage? Now there becomes a very tricky thing. Because if we look at something simple, and there's going to be another test in the challenge for you guys. In the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, we all know them, right? Okay? If you know the Ten Commandments, all ten of them, you can name them. I want you to stand up. And I will give you the one to give them to you. And I want them in the correct order. It's only ten. Sixth law looks like a gun. 
Don't murder. Seventh law. Like a couple walking down the aisle. Uh, don't commit the motion. Okay, the eighth one is a bit tricky. It's like jail bars. Don't steal, otherwise you go to jail. Then number nine, this stuff is saying something to these figures. Lie. Do not lie. The tenth one, you grab it. Do not cover it. Amazing. I learned that last time. So, this brings us to a point a bit later in the sermon. If you really want to learn and know something, you will take the effort and know that the Ten Commandments, it's only ten things. And it is important. It is not that it's not important. If you break one of those ten laws, you will be disqualified from heaven, no matter what you do. And that is the promise of the Bible and the Word, that God will judge us according to our works, according to our sin. And there is none righteous. No one can be saved in itself. Because no one has kept the moral law. Nobody has kept the Ten Commandments perfectly throughout the whole human life. Except Jesus. And maybe two other guys in the Old Testament that went directly to heaven. I'm not sure if they kept the moral law, but they were deemed good enough to go straight to heaven. But Jesus was perfect in his ways. He was the perfect spotless lamb. He had no sin. And can you comprehend that? I can't comprehend that. But it's an amazing thing to understand that Jesus is actually above the moral law. If He is above the moral law, He is the person that we look to, the author and finisher of our faith. And that brings us to those commandments that I spoke of previously in John 14 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now those commandments are commandments that Jesus gave in the New Testament. All of his commandments, all of his sayings. Who wants to, wants to venture and guess how many new commandments he gave us? Ronaldo says two. Okay? Anybody else? Two. Anything a little bit higher? Nothing. Okay? How about 315 new commandments we're supposed to follow? Also didn't know that. Also we could have Googled it yesterday, so I'm not very special by knowing that I googled it and the commandments, what are those commandments I'm speaking of? Who can tell me a commandment that Jesus gave us to follow? Love your enemies. Love your enemies. There's a commandment. And it's not just a good idea. Jesus said it and he says but you have to do it. Oh, already a challenge. How do I love my enemies? Anybody else? There's 300 of them. Never mind the 10 commandments in the Old Testament. There's 300 new commandments that we've received from Jesus' own mouth that we are supposed to do and implement. Now, we were struggling with 10 commandments, knowing the order. I, I don't know the order of the 300, so I'll stop you right there. Maybe, 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 maybe there might be something else coming. There's none. Pray for the sick. So, but I want you to answer because there's 300. You should know at least one of those 300. Paul here gave us two now. So I'm challenging you. Give me a command. Let's see if we can get 30. Yeah. I've got two. exact phrase. You can paraphrase. I think it said this. It's fine. I don't want the exact scripture except the exact, exact wording. I just want the indication. Pay your taxes. Pay your taxes. It's a good one. Obedience. Obedience. Sarah. Be religious in this to serve the widow and the orphans. 
Serve the widows of the church. Anybody else? Go into all the world. Go into all the world, all the nations. Baptizing. Baptizing them in my name, in the name of the Father, the Son. Go. Death. Respect. Authorities. No. Love the Lord God with all your Forgive your brother. Pray. Forgive your brother. Say again. Reach the hospital. Further than what you think. It's not only honoring your mother and your father. 
It's the father and the mother honoring the children. Showing them love and respect, helping them grow, showing them the understanding of what it means to take this narrow path going forward. Exactly like my magnet. I said, I want to show them the path. We know it's not going to be easy. We need the whole congregation, the whole family's help in order to assist us. Because we can't see everything. We can't be everywhere. We can't pray everywhere. The prayers of the, of the mother and the father go so far. And the prayers of the grandfather and grandmother, they go that far. Because that's something special. It's an awesome privilege to be able to pray for your grandkids. Now in this, indicators for us to show where the mark is, it also speaks of the person of Jesus. But it, as you get to that marker, it's not only Jesus saying, you have to do this. It's not Him just saying that, it's Him actually doing it, implementing it, showing us the way, how it should be done, how we should love it. How we should react to difficult circumstances. And that's always the thing that we have to understand. Don't go and do what I say. How does that work for fathers and mothers in the house? Do what I tell you to do. But our actions speak louder than our words, so our kids start doing what we do. I see that so again in my young small girl, she's about three. She can barely reach the table. But Christelle is a, my wife, she's a very neat freak. So the cupboards need to be closed. My cupboards are always open. So I'm getting constantly in trouble because I don't close my cupboards. So then my wife comes, but now my little daughter comes and she closes my cupboards because she's my wife closing them. Or the plates, the plates have to be moved, and now this deal, or this taking this plate, and you just uh, wanting to stop, but she's very hard here. I spoke to her, she can't take the plate from me, it's just a bigger mess. So you're just walking after her, and you can see her imitating her mother, and her brothers, and me, in so many aspects. And that is what we will be as humans are. It's one thing to listen to what somebody says, but some, when somebody shows you how to do it, it speaks so much more volume. Your understanding is so much bigger. And that is who Jesus is. He isn't just the one that says we're supposed to do this and this. We are imitating Christ as He does, as He did, and we're supposed to do as well. I just want to read the verse, James 1 from verse 21 to 27. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with the meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, not hearers of the deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he is. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty continues in it, and is not forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, the one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion for God the, God the Father is this. To visit orphans, widows, and trouble, and keep oneself unspotted from the world. We are called to be doers as followers. As we follow Jesus, we see his example and we do his example. As he did, we must also do. But it's not as a stepping stone or a table. God done it's up now one step higher. And so you climb in steps and faith. It's actually reverse. As your faith increases, you are able to take the steps required. We have reverse. 
and I'll do this and this, and then I will tithe, and I will get this. I will obey, give, and I will get this. But you do that automatically. Once it becomes an automatic overflow of your faith, your faith in Jesus, your trust, your love for Him, it's a different response. It's a different religion as it stands there. Religion, our word in context is not always positive, but in this context it is quite significant. There's something profound that just God just showed me in this preparing for the sermon. Being a believer is not enough. What is your testimony if you just believe? Our testimonies are grounded in what we do. Because our faith activates something for us to do, react, respond. And then God in turn responds to that step of faith we take. He does something miraculous and changes and transforms not only us but the people around us. And that forms our testimony. And by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimonies, the world will be changed. And that is where the strength of the gospel lies, of being able to say, I'm a Christian, a follower of Jesus. Now, I've many times experienced my spiritual life, my religious life, has God playing hide and seek? Just almost grasping His truth, understanding His fullness, understanding what He wants to say in His word, then it feels slips away. It feels like many times He's hiding the truth from me, which is totally unbelievable and unscriptural. There's nothing. It's me. It's us. We feel we keep missing God. We keep searching for Jesus, searching for God because we want to follow Him as I described now. But in reality, we're hiding away. Thinking we're looking for Jesus, but we're hiding away. We're not looking for Him. And Jesus is sitting next to us, stepping us on the shoulder, saying, When, when will you feel? His hand on your shoulder. When will you respond to my hand holding yours, wanting to lead you in that truth of understanding? And it's such a beautiful example in Luke 19, verse 1 to 10. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacharias, or Zacchaeus, who was the chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature, he was a short man. So he ran ahead and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. When they saw him, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Good Lord, I give half my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. And we are the ones that are lost, hiding in a way of shame and guilt. And Jesus comes to find us. And we have to have that ability like to appear to understand that this man is different. This man is something special. I will climb a tree. Let go of my dignity to be able to just to see you. And when that expression comes to fullness, when he stops at the tree and looks you in the eyes and says, Come down. I want to dine with you today. That is the God that we serve. It's, that goes beyond our understanding. And we think the way that he should act or do is not what he wants to do. 
wants us all to realize we were perfectly, wonderfully, fearfully made in the mother's arms. Knitted together in love by God our Father. That perfectly demonstrated his love on the cross when Jesus died on that to pay the fine for our sins. And we can be set free from every temptation, every struggle that we face. As long as we put our faith in Him, say, God, you're the one that I trust. I'm a follower of Jesus. Not because I must, not because I want to. And I love Him not because I must, but because I want to. And He's worthy to be loved, He's worthy to be praised. There is none like Him. We proclaim the name of Jesus. And do we understand what that means? And so many times fail. The beauty of our Lord is so simple, actually. And He holds His hand and says, I want to spend time with you. Will you spend time with me? to God must be deep than he is, and then he is a rewarder of those who religion to see him. Now we have the faith to say, but I know who this God is. And we are rewarded according to that faith. And that faith is demonstrated in what we do and the way that we live. Exactly like you said. But in a slightly deeper context. Wanting to understand and know who Jesus is and how he's supposed to follow him. Such a crucial and critical task for us in our daily lives. And we have to follow by example to do what Jesus did. Because the ones that follow us will mimic and imitate what we do for fathers, for mothers, for grandfathers, for grandmothers. How does kids will mimic whatever we do? It's such a powerful picture of a renowned preacher. Before he got saved, he went, he had such a depressing life at one stage, he wanted to go to the barn, but it was snowing outside. And he just left his family and went to the barn. So it's snowing, and it's snowing heavily, so the snow is deep. And just as he's about to enter into the bar, he hears his son's voice calling out to him. And as he turns around, he as a big man walk in the snow, but his son was difficult. So the only way he could keep up with his dad in the snow was that he jumped from footprint to footprint. And that just so perfectly illustrated the wrong connection we so many times have in ourselves because we lead by example and the ones that follow follow in our footsteps and if we make the footsteps it will usually lead to a disaster but if we follow the footsteps of Jesus we will have life in abundance maybe not perfect in the way that the world sees it but when God looks at it he says I will bless you I want just want to invite you as we close.